Hello, chemistry students. Today, we're going to talk about electrons, um, specifically Bohr models and electron configurations, and how they relate to the electronic structure of the atom, how all the electrons are arranged in the various shells and orbitals of the atom. So below here, I have two models of an atom. The one on the left is called a Bohr model. Um, it's very simplistic. Uh, it's not exactly accurate to what atoms look like in reality, but it's a really clear way to demonstrate how many electrons are in the various uh, energy shells of an atom. You can see here that whatever this atom is, uh, it's a carbon atom, has two electrons in one ring and four electrons in another ring. Each of these rings represent energy levels or places the electrons can be. What things look like in reality is a little bit more fuzzy and complicated. So the Bohr models are really good for explaining things. They're really good at showing the electronic structure of an atom without thinking too hard about the sort of fuzzy reality of things. So let's talk about how to draw these Bohr models. So to draw a Bohr model, we need to consider the following properties of elements. So I already mentioned how electrons exist in different shells. So here we have a carbon with its two shells and its six electrons. The next thing we need to consider is how many electrons can fit in each shell. None of, none of the shells are exactly equal in their properties. So we need to, to learn how many each can store. So the first orbital shell can hold two electrons. The second can hold eight. So if something like carbon that has six electrons, it's going to have two in its first shell and four in its second shell, and then also room for four more in its other shell if it was to gain some electrons. And uh, an important part about uh, an atom in general is its valence electrons. When we did the card sort activity before, and we saw those little sticks poking out of each of the, the atoms. Those represent the valence electrons. And those are really important because they influence the element's chemical properties. That's why everything in a group has similar properties and then also had the same number of sticks. The amount of valence electrons kind of controls how an element can behave and how it can bond. And you can always know how many valence electrons things are going to have by the column that they're in. If you look at the periodic table, you'll see that carbon is in group 4A. It corresponds to the group that has four valence electrons. And if you were to draw a Bohr model of anything in that row, uh, or sorry, anything in that column, you would see that it's no matter what, it still only has four electrons in its outer shell. So uh, knowing that the first can hold two, the second can hold eight, and the third can hold 18, let's figure out what this element is. So let's see, we have three energy shells. Um, oh, also, you'll note that the number of shells that are occupied with electrons also corresponds to the row that it, the periodic table is in. You'll note in the previous example, carbon is in the second row, and it has two energy shells. So whatever this one is, is going to have th has three energy shells, so it's likely in the third row. So let's count our electrons. That'll be a good clue into what kind of element this is. So we have two in the first shell, eight in the second shell, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the third shell. So that's two plus eight, 10 plus another eight, that's 18 total electrons. And if we assume that this is a neutral element, we know that it'll also have 18 protons. So if we look at the periodic table, we could see that this corresponds to argon. All right, so say we wanted to draw a Bohr model of fluorine. And also we wanted to figure out how many valence electrons it has. Well, fluorine is in the second row, so it's gonna have two shells, and it has uh, nine electrons. So two are gonna go in the first shell, and then we're gonna have seven in the outer shell. So that means that we're gonna draw it like this, two electrons in the first level, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the second level. Um, a common way to draw these is to draw one dot at the top, one right, one bottom, one left, and then start doubling up. Um, so then we have one electron over here by itself, and this shows that we have seven valence electrons. Um, and also everything in the same column as fluorine, bromine, chlorine, iodine, those are all going to have seven valence electrons. Another way of representing atoms is with something called an electron dot diagram. These are going to be really useful when we start discussing bonds, because like I said, the valence electrons control the types of bonds that can be made. And with these, we don't need to show all of the shells. We're only showing the outer shells. So if we can determine how many valence electrons an element has, um, which we can usually do by looking at its position on the periodic table, which column it's in, all we have to do is write the atom symbol and then show how many valence electrons it has by putting one on top, one right, one bottom, one left, and then 
doubling up if we have to. So carbon with only four valence electrons, we'll just have one on each side of the letter. Uh, nitrogen, which has five, we'll put two on top and then one on each of the other sides because it has five total valence electrons. Um, so Bohr models are really helpful to show the different energy levels um, that the electrons can exist in. But kind of like I said before, the, the reality of things are a lot more complicated. Um, and to actually get into why they're, they can, why each shell can hold the number of electrons that it can, we need to talk about something called the Schrodinger model. The Schrodinger model is a mathematical interpretation of energy levels of an atom done with a bunch of fancy physics and calculus. You don't really need to know any of the math behind it, but somebody was able to figure out what all of the actual orbitals, all of the like shapes of the orbitals look like. And it turns out they look something like this. Some of them are spheres, some of them are these sort of balloon shaped things. It's actually pretty weird, but despite the weirdness of this, it actually shows uh, what an atom or it, it models the atom really accurately in ways that we can predict and actually uh, prove with experiments. So to understand this uh, model, we need to understand how electrons are uh, arranged in the atom. And there's not just energy shells like we showed before, but there's also things called subshells, which are uh, types of uh, types of orbitals with different shapes that exist within an energy level. And then those subshells are broken up into orbitals. So we have sort of three tiers of structures. We have energy levels or energy shells. We have subshells, which are the types of shapes of the things that are at each level. And then orbitals, which are the individual places that we actually put electrons. So uh, a shell can have multiple subshells at orbitals depending on what level that it's at. And there's four types of subshells that um, are proven to exist from the Schrodinger model. And we call them S, P, D, and F subshells. And if you look at this diagram here, it kind of shows the shapes of them. You can see that S subshells, which exist at every level, are sort of spheres. Uh, P subshells, which start at the second level and continue down to the, the seventh level, are those sort of balloon-shaped ones, or they're like pairs of balloons. And then there are D subshells, which are like sort of clover shaped. They're like uh, if you took two balloons, tied them together, and then two more balloons and tied them together and kind of put them in a clover shape. And then F is just a big lump of these things. Um, and the, the D subshells don't appear till the third energy level, and the F subshells don't appear till the fourth energy level. And anything that would have uh, D or F subshells beyond are like atoms that are too big to exist. So these are the main subshells that we need to consider. So we have our S's, our P's, our D's, and our F's, and these are the levels that they correlate to. And we label the subshells with a number and a letter. So the letter represents the shape, um, and then the number represents which level that it's at. I know this is a bit complicated, but this is all gonna come, to, kind of come together with the organization of the periodic table. So the amount of electrons that could be stored at each level of the atom corresponds to the energy level that has electrons in it and which subshells are available at that energy level. Below here is a diagram of all of the different shapes of the orbitals. The S ones, like I said before, are spheres. These are what the P ones look like. Uh, they're like these double balloon things that are oriented along the three uh, three-dimensional axes, and then our D ones and our F ones get a lot more complicated. But for S orbitals, there's only one type of S subshell. So at whenever we're dealing with S orbitals, there's only ever going to be one of them. If we're at an energy level that has P subshells, there's going to be three of them. If we're at an energy level that has D subshells, there's going to be five of them. If we're at an energy level that has F subshells, there's going to be seven of them. And each orbital, each of these little shapes can hold two total electrons. So that means that the subshells can hold a total number of electrons of the number of orbitals times two. So an S subshell can hold two electrons because there's only one orbital. P subshells, which have three orbitals, can hold six electrons because there's three of them and each of them can hold two. For D, it'll be five times two, so that'll be 10 total electrons that can fit within D subshells. And then for F, since there are seven, that'll be 14 total electrons that can fit in that subshell. Um, so 
not every energy level or shell has all of the subshells. I kind of mentioned this before, but this diagram does a good job of showing it where our first level only has S subshells, our second level has S and P, our third has S, P, D, S, P, and D, and our fourth level has S, P, D, and F. And then all of the ones below that have the same sort of uh, same sort of orientation. Now, this actually helps us explain the thing we showed earlier with the Bohr models about why the first level can only hold two, the second level can hold eight, and the third level can hold 18. Because if we consider what we saw on the last slide, uh, the first level, which only has an S orbital, only has an S subshell, can only fit two electrons. That's why there, there's only two electrons that can go in that first ring, that most inner ring. For the second level, it has S and P. If you remember from the last slide, there are three P orbitals within the P subshell, and if each of them can hold two, that's six from the P, but then the second level has an S and a P, so it has two from the S and six from the P, which gives us eight total. The third has S, P, and D. If we remember from the last one, D has five different orbitals, and if each of them can hold two, that's a total of 10. So then we have 10 plus eight plus two, sorry, 10 plus six plus two, that's a total of 18 for the third level. So if we were to try to predict how many electrons a fourth energy level could hold, well, let's look at this diagram. So the fourth energy level is when we start to get the four F orbitals. So if we have seven different four, uh, sorry, seven different uh, F orbitals, and each of them can hold two, that'll be seven times two, that's 14, plus the D, which is uh, five times two, 10. So that's 14 plus 10, that's 24. And then the P has three orbitals, each can hold two, so that's plus six. And then the S has one, which has two, so it's basically 14 plus 10 plus six plus two. So we get a total of 32 electrons for our fourth level. So as a review, I have this graph here, or this table here, that shows us um, the relationship between the shells, the max number of electrons, and the available subshells. So as a review, we have S, P, D, and F subshells. We have a number of orbitals of one, three, five, and seven for each of them. And since each of them can hold two electrons, it'll be whatever this number is times two is the max number of electrons that can be contained in those subshells. And at the first energy level, we only have S available to us, so that's two. At the second level, we have S and P, so that's two plus six, so that's eight. At the third energy level, we have S, P, and D, so that's two plus six plus 10, so that's 18. And for the fourth energy level, we have S, P, D, and F, so that's a total of 14 plus 10 plus six plus two, that's 32 total electrons. So an analogy to try to think about this is that atoms are kind of like a dresser. Um, each a dresser has a bunch of like rows of drawers, and then there are different drawers at each row. And then maybe imagine that this dresser has like little boxes inside the uh, dressers where you can store things like jewelry or, or shoes or, you know, maybe things you're trying to hide. Um, but in this analogy, you can think about each level of the dresser, like one of the energy levels, and then the different drawers are kind of like subshells. So they're the different places that the electrons are split up into. And then if you imagine that there are boxes within these drawers, those are kind of like the orbitals. Those are the individual places that you actually put electrons. So I know this is all kind of complicated, but there is something called an electron configuration, which is basically like an address that shows where all of the electrons are that sort of condenses this idea into a thing that's easy to communicate. And let's see what I mean by that. So an electron configuration um, it is a way to show the electronic structure um, as sort of a code, and it has three components. So we have energy levels, which are denoted by numbers, subshells, which are denoted by letters, and number of electrons in each subshell, which are denoted by superscripts. So we saw before that the uh, notation for the, the subshells were energy level and then a letter, either S, P, D, or F. So the number in front tells us which energy level it's at, and then the letter tells us what type of subshell is being occupied. And then if we wanna show how many electrons are in that orbital or in that subshell, we put a little exponent on top. Um, so say we want to write the code for helium. Well, helium only has two electrons, so it's just going to have two electrons in its first energy shell, and the first energy shell only has S uh, subshells available to it. 
So that means we're going to have one S, which is the, uh, if you recall, the first energy levels available subshells. And it's going to have two electrons. Since it's the second element, it has two protons. It's going to have an equal number of protons and electrons. So we write it as 1s2. And if we're going to write, uh, if the, the 1s2 basically is code for saying that helium has two electrons in its 1s subshell. And say we want to make something a little bit more complicated, like sodium, which has 11 electrons. Well, if you were to draw a Bohr model for it, you'd see that there are two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell, and then one electron in the third shell, in the third energy level. So we can draw the first shell as 1s2, since there's only s subshells available at the first level. The second level has s and p. Two of them are going to go in the s subshell, and six of them are going to go in the p subshell. So we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And then that last electron, that single valence electron for sodium, is going to go in the 3s. The S subshell is always the first one to put electrons in. If you look back at this one, if you follow the arrows, it kind of shows you the order that they fill in. So we start at 1S, and then 2S, and then 2P, and then 3S, and then uh, 3P, and then 4S, and then 3D. It has kind of an order to it. So use this as a reference point. Um, but uh, I'm going to show you something in a, in a moment that actually helps you know the order just by looking at the periodic table. But back to the sodium example, this code basically tells us that sodium has two electrons in its first subshell, in its 1s subshell. Uh, in its second energy level, it has eight electrons. Two of them are in the 2s subshell, and six of them are in the 2p subshell. And in the third energy level, there's one single electron in the 3s subshell, denoted by the one here at the end. This s subshell can also hold one more electron, but sodium only has one electron there. But if we were to draw the element uh, next to sodium, which is uh, magnesium, that would end in 3s2 instead. All right, so I mentioned earlier that this actually maps to the periodic table. So this, there's a really useful way to figure out what the electron configuration is just by looking at the element's position on the periodic table. So you'll see here that I have this periodic table here that is color coded. Um, based off of the color, it tells you where the um, the last valence electron is going to go. So the, the green elements here, this is called the S block because their last valence electron is going to go into an S subshell. For the blue ones, these the, the mostly nonmetals over here, their last valence electron is going to go into a P subshell. So we call this the P block. The pink ones, um, their last electron is going to go into a D subshell. And the yellow ones, this the lanthanides and actinides, which we're not really going to see much of, um, their, their last electrons are going to go into the F block. Um, so just by looking at this, we can tell what the last bit of the code is going to be. So say we're trying to figure out uh, uh, what subshell the two valence electrons of strontium are in. Well, strontium is here in the S block, and it's at the fifth level. So we can assume that the code for strontium is going to end in 5S. Two. So there's another thing that is really important to note about the organization of the periodic table. So this is going to seem kind of complicated, and we're going to go into this a bit more next class. But you can see here that the rows correspond to the energy levels. But for the D block elements, the, the D subshells that are going to be filled as we go across the transition metals are all one energy level less. So if we're figuring out what, say, let's say the, the, the electron configuration for scandium, it's going to end in 4s2 and then 3d1, because the d subshell that we fill after this is going to be in the third energy level, because the electrons get kind of tucked back in in an inner shell. And we'll, we'll show a bit more about why that is later. But for now, just know that the 3d block rows are considered to be one energy level less, and then the f blocks are considered to be two energy levels less. But what, what this all means is that we can actually figure out what the electron configuration of an element is going to be just based off its position on the periodic table. So for example, let's do like aluminum. Aluminum is here. So if I wanted to know what the electron configuration for aluminum is, well, I find it on the periodic table. I can see that it's in the P block in the third shell. So that means it's going to end in 3P1. So then I can assume that all of the shells before that are full, and I can just kind of go step by step and read it left to right, top to bottom. So the first energy level is going to be full, so 1s2. 
the second energy level is going to be full, so 2s2, 2p6. The third energy level is going to be uh, partially full. The, the 3s is going to be full, so 3s2. And then it's going to end in 3p1. So the overall configuration for aluminum is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p1. Um, and let's consider sulfur. So sulfur is in the third row, so it has three shells. Um, it's a couple elements after aluminum. It's in the P block, meaning its outermost electrons are going to be in the P subshell. And it's the fourth element into the P block, so that means it has four electrons in that subshell. So that means the last part of the electron configuration is going to be 3P4. So we can say that the full configuration for sulfur is 1S2, 2S2, 2P6, 3S2, 3P4. Um, let's try a little bit of a trickier one, uh, titanium, which is here. This is going to this is going to force us to consider that these D uh, subshells are one energy level less. Um, so we're going to have to kind of we're going to end in a, a D subshell that's going to be in the third level, but there's going to be a four one before it. So if, as long as we just remember that all of these D subshells are one energy level less, we can still just read left to right, top to bottom. So it'll be one S two, two S two. 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then 3d2. And that's going to be our configuration for titanium. Um, and that is all I have to talk about for this um, in terms of electron configurations. I know this is going to seem really complicated at first, but we're going to do some more practice with this next class, and you're going to start to see the patterns for it. Because it's really important to know how all of the electrons are arranged. Because because it has a large impact on both the physical and chemical properties of each element. So hopefully this was at least somewhat helpful, and uh, I'll see you next class.